Uh, first of all, before I begin, I wanted to thank uh, Bear for the opportunity to have me here uh, presenting today, and also for just giving me all the support during the last year that I was here at Stanford uh, financially, and also giving me the tools to go into the job market and then start my uh, job at Purdue. Um, so the work that we do in our in our group is uh, soft tissue mechanics, uh, and particularly mechanics and microbiology of skin. We use skin as a model system to try to understand how tissues adapt. Uh, to mechanical cues. We have a bunch of different projects, but the one that I'm uh, going to be talking about is reconstructive surgery. We do a little bit of uh, pressure ulcer work and wound healing work, uh, skin growth due to tissue expansion, uh, and just multi scale mechanics of uh, biological tissues. Um, also, just a little bit of a warning that there might be some graphic uh, forecasts <laughs> in the talk, so just uh, I try to put all of them in grayscale. There might be a couple that are not in grayscale. Uh, so what you can see here is that you know, wound healing determines healing outcomes, uh, particularly complications. So you can see here is a child that had a giant birthmark in the leg that needed to be resected because of malignant uh, potential. And in order to do that, tissue expanders were put in place and inflated over a period of time, which leads to skin growth, which is not the topic of today, but that's also something that we do. And then after that, uh, the flaps were created and to resurface the, the wound. Now the problem is that in this case the edge, uh, the distal end of the flap was closed with too much uh, stress which leads to compression in the normal direction of skin, which leads to lack of blood flow, which leads to necrosis, which then it's a, it's a complication so the tissue had to be um, cleaned a little bit and then left to heal by secondary intention but that usually leads to fibrosis. So what you have at the end uh, stage is a child that has uh, contracture in the knee joint. So we obviously would like to avoid that. Now what are the challenges in doing that or what are the challenges that the clinicians uh, face? Uh, one of them is that there's this variability of the biological response and also the material properties for the, uh, among the different uh, patient populations. Uh, the specific procedure that a patient has to go through, uh, the, the anatomical uh, region where the uh, operation takes place, and also that we lack tools to easily measure the stress uh, in the operating room. So usually the, the surgeons uh, base their, their decisions on trial and error and just their experience. Uh, now ideally we would be able to use computational models to try to predict where the stress distribution, the, the stress concentration would occur and to try to anticipate the healing uh, response. So that's, that's kind of what I do in my lab for, for this particular project. Uh, now there are two main challenges that we have for how to apply these computational tools to, to the clinical setting uh, to make them really, really useful. One of them is to easily get patient-specific geometries. We do have a lot of ways of getting uh, three-dimensional geometries of uh, soft tissues. The problem usually is that it needs either expensive equipment or some expert training. So we wanted to come up with something that was really easy to, to do that could be scalable and uh, inexpensive. And then the other challenge is what I was talking about, this uncertainty in the behavior of the different tissues among patient populations. And this is the, the illustration. If you have an, a deterministic uh, set of geometry material properties, you, and you just solve the mechanical equilibrium problem, you would get a deterministic result. Uh, but the problem is that if you have a little bit of uncertainty, then that gets uh, amplified by, by the, the surgery, especially if you have a nonlinear model connecting you know, the, the tissue mechanics. So in order to do that, we need to be able to incorporate this into the analysis, which is not something that has been done uh, much for biological materials. Typically, we only see this type of one single parameter simulations, so not, not the uncertainty analysis. So what I'm trying to do, which is slightly more fundamental than the, the geometry acquisition, is trying to do uh, models that can take uh, uncertainty into account. And to do that, I, I, I'm developing reduced and surrogate models for uh, nonlinear fine elements. Now, why are these uh, models important? Because soft tissues are very uh, nonlinear and also uh, subject to large deformations. So this is an example of a strain energy function that describes biological tissues. It tends to have an exponential function, and these are parameters that we're taking from the literature, measure uh, ex vivo for skin samples. And then what you can see here, these are the probability contours for three different very simple uh, tests of uh, material, uniaxial, off biaxial, and biaxial uh, tests. And you can see obviously that as you increase more the deformation, you have more nonlinearity in the material response, and then you also have more spread out of the probability density function for the stress. So 
clearly, if you were you know, in the low deformation regime, you could maybe uh, not take the uncertainty in the material properties into account, but having this very nonlinear response and very large deformation setting, definitely you need to consider that. Now let me take a step back for uh, the patient-specific geometry. I'm going to come back to the uncertainty in a little bit. But for the patient-specific geometry, as I said, we wanted to come up with something that was really uh, easy to do in the operating room that any surgeon would be able to, to take on. And so we found this uh, algorithm. This was actually developed through the computer vision field uh, to create 3D geometries of buildings. But it's, very, it's a very power, powerful tool. Uh, all you have to do is take a lot of 2D photographs of a static scene, about 20 to 30. But you can do this with an iPhone as long as you put something that allows you to scale the, the model afterwards. And then the, the algorithm basically consists of uh, feature matching across pairs of photographs. And then based on those feature, uh, features that you match in the photographs, you can recreate uh, or calculate the position of the camera uh, and, and get a really nice uh, 3D model. So in this case, we were, we were interested in a clinical case of a, of a child that had a, an ulceration in the, in the scalp. She also had a, a skull defect, so we had also a, additionally in this case a CT scan, but we have done uh, just the geometry without the, the CT scan as well. And you can see here the, the patient specific model in the, in the bottom right uh, corner. So let me just show you the simulation. This is for uh, just a single set of material properties. <clears throat> so you get some uh, distribution of the stress. Now, the problem, as I said, is that you don't want to just evaluate one single set of material properties where you would like to uh, take into account the uncertainty. So what we do to, to do that, we do two steps. One is model order reduction. For that, we run a bunch of simulations with different parameters. And then we do PCA, which is principal component analysis. It's some sort of eigenvector decomposition. And that uh, allows us to see the main modes of stress. And in this case, we reduce the dimensions from 4,000 nodes, which is the, the degrees of freedom of the finite element model, to only three. So three main modes of formation. And then, then we have to build a function that connects these three inputs to these three outputs. And for that, we use a probabilistic model, which is called Gaussian process regression, which gives you an estimate not only of the uh, response, but a, a, an estimate of how good or bad your, your model is. So this, the variance of your model. So doing that, what we can do is we can actually explore a wide range of material parameters. We have this suction device to estimate the, the properties of the skin, non-invasively in vivo. But obviously, this suction device doesn't give you very detailed information. So what we get out of that is just some estimate of the material properties. And then with this probabilistic model, we can now estimate what are the regions that might be more at risk. So in this case, we found two regions that could be more potentially at risk. And indeed, in the 30-day follow-up, we see that the patient did have a, a little bit of necrosis in one of those, those regions. So while this not doesn't completely validate the model, it does point out that, yes, indeed, uh, you know, we, the predictions do align well with the clinical findings. Um, so we, this was a very specific case, so we are trying not to move to something that is more repeatable. So we are focusing now on uh, skin resection cancer, and this is because um, there's, the techniques are a little bit more uh, standard, so these are called rotation flaps. And then this actually made us wonder what were the what are the stress patterns for different surgeries. And so we were investigating sort of ideal types of uh, flap situations. These are three common strategies that are used to resurface the skin. And then one of the things that we found is that these lead to completely different stress patterns. So then we are now trying to do some uh, optimization of the of the flap design. So kind of topology optimization for for this. And even before that. Wrap up, but we are also trying to do the same. So we're trying to replace the fine, expensive finite element models with a very cheap model. So we again run a bunch of simulations, like 15,000 simulations, with a different set of parameters, different set of these different sizes, and we build these very cheap uh, models. So this, this is almost my last slide. Uh, so these are <laughs> predictions from. I, I can see. I can see. The, I feel the pressure. Uh, <laughs> So these are, for example, uh, predictions from the, from the surrogate model. So as I said, we, we ran 15,000 uh, simulations, but then after running that, that is basically done offline. Then you have this Python code that all it does is it stores these 10,000 by 10,000 matrices, a few of them. But the evaluation is very cheap. It's just a matrix vector multiplication to, to be able to predict the, the stress contour uh, as a function of the different, different sizes and material parameters. 
So then the advantage, the advantage of this is that you don't need to really run any more Fire simulations to get any of these uh, stress contours. You just have Python, a Python code. Obviously, you did some work, so there's some work we have to do offline in order to be able to build this model. So now we are trying to, to go from this to the topology optimization. So just to conclude, most views there in the operating room allows us to calculate accurate 3D geometry. We have compared this to 3D photos, and uh, we get basically the same level of accuracy. Material behavioral setting is a hallmark of biological tissues, but it's often disregarded. Uh, uncertainty propagation is important, especially because of the large deformations and the nonlinear behavior of uh, tissues, and for that we use reduce order and surrogate modeling techniques. For the reproduce order modeling, we, we use principal component analysis, and for the surrogate, we use a probabilistic model Gaussian, a Gaussian process, and then we explore different uh, flat designs. And I think that's about it. So if you have any questions, and if you want to visit our lab, this is our lab meeting. Thank you. So I'm currently an assistant professor at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana. Um, I just graduated um, just over a year ago. Uh, so um, my lab at Notre Dame is the Computational Mechanics of Morphology at Notre Dame, uh, or Command Lab. I spent a lot of time on that acronym. And our long-term goal is to use computational tools and engineering knowledge to understand the role of mechanics in the development of the brain, so a different organ system than, than we just heard about, uh, across both health and different neurological disorders and diseases. So <clears throat> brain is a little bit of a different topic than uh, some engineers are used to working with. So I have a short quiz uh, for you to get your juices flowing, get in the mood. Um, so these are six uh, images of animal uh, brains that have been sliced in and stained and imaged. Uh, and I want to see if you can identify a human brain. So think to yourself, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. Uh, so who thinks that A is a human brain? Raise your hand. Anybody? Okay. All right, good. Uh, that's a dolphin. So dolphins have a lot of very small folds. Um, so this is the feature that I'm basically interested in studying. So that is not us. Anybody think B? Okay. Um, so B is a dog. Uh, these, are all, these are not to scale, so they're all the same size, uh, so to not give it away too much. But dogs have fewer folds uh, than a dolphin. What about C? Anybody think C? Okay. C is a chimpanzee, so it's very close. Um, more folds than a dog, less than a, than a dolphin. Anybody D? Okay. D is a rabbit. Rabbits have almost smooth brains. Um, there's like a, a fold you know, between the hemispheres, but overall their brains are mostly smooth, with very, very shallow curves when they have them. What about E? Okay, most people think E. So that is a human brain, congratulations. Um, and so you see kind of, you know, similar, some definite similarities to the chimpanzee brain, but fewer folds than the dolphin, for instance. Dolphins and whales have very folded brains. So what about F? Anybody think F? Adrian's seen this before though, maybe. <laughs> Also, so it's a trick question because this is also a human brain. So this is uh, at around 21 weeks of gestation. Um, and at that time, our brains are still uh, very smooth. So I show this, first of all, because I find it fascinating how little intuition we have about what's inside our own heads. Uh, and also because this process is basically what I study. So um, during gestation, from about 20 weeks to full term, our brains undergo a huge number of changes. They get significantly bigger and they start to deform uh, and develop these folds. And this process of diarification is what I study. So this is, these are images to scale now and kind of in 3D to show again this process. So the brain is getting a lot bigger and it's folding and deforming in a lot of really intricate ways. <clears throat> so a couple, um, uh, so some background information you should have. So this is actually an MRI of my brain, so like this. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so the cortex is the outer layer of the brain, this gray layer that kind of cur hugs the, the curves. Um, so that, that's the, the cortex. And uh, so its thickness is the cortical thickness. Um, and that's, uh, it's an important biomarker of neurological health. And so that's something that's very interesting to us. So the cortex as it folds forms sulci, which are the valleys of the folds, and gyri, which are the uh, peaks of the folds, basically. So yeah, silica and gyre there. Um, and so there's this consistent pattern in brains that we see um, that we see very consistently within individuals and between individuals. 
that sulci tend to be thin and diarrhea-thick. So these are nine representative human brains. Actually, three of us are in this room right now <laughs> because we gathered this data on the cheap. <laughs> um, so, uh, so these are nine representative, healthy, very intelligent human brains. <laughs> and uh, so I tell you, the, they're artificially inflated uh, here, so they appear mostly smooth. Um, and I colored the sulcal regions here by their average thickness on this scale, and then these are the gyral regions. So you see that the sulcal regions tend to be blue, like on the lower, thinner side, and gyral regions tend to be thicker on the red side of the scale. So this is a thing that's been known in the brain for a long time, um, but with my advisor, Ellen Cool, we started to question how this variation arises. So one uh, ex possible explanation, yeah? Just a quick question. How did you measure thickness? Sorry, I didn't get that. Oh, so these are from MRIs, and uh, we like resurf uh, reconstruct the surface, different so surfaces of the brain. Sections that you're in here. It's yeah, not just that. Okay. yeah, but it is, um, yeah, there's sections we can create 3D surfaces and measure. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, okay, so one possible explanation of how this variation could arise is that you know cells migrate to different parts of the brain. They migrate to one part. Uh, more of them migrate to one part. It gets thicker, and it becomes a gyrus less to another part and it gets thinner and so that's a sulcus. So these differences in cell migration could be the cause of this. And so that would be sort of a biological hypothesis. Um, but we suggest a mechanical hypothesis where there's a different mechanical state in these two regions because of the boundary conditions and the tension and compression that they're experiencing in bending. So the differences in the mechanical state lead to this, this thickness difference. So to investigate this, um, we looked at the thickness ratio in a number of purely mechanical systems that wouldn't have any source of biological heterogeneity. So we did some uh, numerical simulations. These are finite element simulations where you have the elements are growing, and we see consistently that gyri, or the peaks, are thicker than sulci, or the valleys. And then we also did some polymer experiments. This was done with a collaborator, Sylvie Budai, at um, uh, FAU Erlang in Nuremberg. Uh, so again, no source of biological heterogeneity here. The film is initially of uniform thickness, but after folding, we see thicker gyri and thinner sulci. Um, so these uh, support our hypothesis that there's some mechanical role in this, these thickness variations. So with a collaborator at Oxford, Alain Grielli, we also fit the human brains, the polymer experiments, an analytical solution, and the computational results to a single, uh, I mean, to this, to this figure so you can see that the trends are, are very similar to each other. So uh, looking forward, the, the next steps, this work was just published in the physical review letters. So looking forward, I'm interested in uh, analyzing thickness ratio during development. So with two collaborators at UNC, um, they study thickness, cortical thickness during development. So they have a large number of subjects that they've uh, studied at at birth, at year one and year two, uh, and analyze the, the thickness in, in different regions. So here we can see that uh, generally thickness increases in the different lobes of the brain uh, as, as babies grow and develop, but the gyri and, and sulci thicken differently. So gyri get more thicker, if that makes sense, than sulcal regions do. And that's where this uh, ratio comes from and increases. Um, the, another project that I'm working on right now, so this is an undergrad at Notre Dame who's working with me, is investigating thickness ratio in other animals. So there's a large atlas of primate brains, uh, different primates, and um, we're trying to look at what cortical thickness and the cortical thickness ratio looks like in these different species. So basically we have this mechanical model that is predicting thickness ratio, uh, and we want to compare our predictions with measurements but in human brains, there's only so much variation in size and foldedness and things like that. But in animal brains, there's a huge variety. So these are, these are all to scale, so we have you know, huge differences in size, very folded brains, not so much. And so we're trying to see how well our models uh, predict these, uh, this thickness ratio in, in all these different animals. Uh, another thing that I'm working on right now is looking at thickness ratio in neurological disorders. So, um, as I mentioned, cortical thickness is a really uh, important pre uh, predictor and indicator of, of neurological health. So it shows up in epilepsy and schizophrenia and, and autism spectrum disorder, or ASD. So uh, I was recently awarded a, 
pilot grant by Notre Dame's Advanced Diagnostics and Therapeutics Group to uh, look at an, um, cortical thickness ratios as a potential uh, diagnosis tool for ASD. So we're analyzing normal and abnormal thicknesses and trying to understand the evolution of them over time and the variations in different regions. And the idea, the hope is that we could identify pathways for potential diagnosis and treatment. So this work is done in partnership with the Autism and Developmental Disorders Research Program here at, Notre Dame, at, here at Stanford at the medical school. Um, and I had a Notre Dame undergraduate working on, with me on this as well, Kira Tui. So the summary is that um, basically in, in my work we're investigating cortical thickness differences, uh, trying to understand both their biological and mechanical causes during human development, and we're looking at this in primates um, and in other animals, uh, in neurological disorders, and the goal is to better understand the, the form and the function of the brain and how they work together. Uh, so for more information, uh, this is the paper that was just accepted. Um, and this is my lab website, email, and Twitter, if you want to catch me there. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to uh, take questions if there are any. So I am currently an assistant professor in the mechanical and aerospace engineering department at George Washington University in Washington, DC. And um, generally, my lab broadly creates energy technologies using advanced materials and manufacturing techniques. And that is very broad, um, and that's by design, because um, I am just the type of personality that likes to look at all parts of the picture and understand how it all comes together. And so what my group does um, is very broad, um, which is what frustrated, I think, Ken, my PhD advisor here, <laughs> was not happy unless I looked at the entire picture. Um, we, we spend a lot of time working on manufacturing with novel materials, and I'll talk about um, one of our biggest projects in that today. But what I like to do is understand how does that connect to the energy devices and systems that these technologies would go into. And um, if we're actually going to provide real energy solutions for the world, then we need to understand how those materials and manufacturing techniques that make devices and are put together into systems would actually be able to make it into the marketplace. And so for fun, <laughs> um, on my own, and occasionally with a student who wants to do an independent research um, study with me, I do techno-economic analyses um, of the technologies that we work on to predict um, where are we most sensitive to that technology being able to penetrate the market. Um, so I do that just for fun. Um, when I was uh, finishing up my PhD, um, I had transitioned to working on nanomaterials for energy devices. Um, and I was really lucky to be able to collaborate with Alberta Saleo's group here at Stanford uh, because they were working on um, nanostructured materials that were much easier to manufacture um, than how materials had been made um, up to date. And so I really liked that idea because I saw that as a restriction in terms of the technologies actually um, being much more available for the applications. Um, but the challenge was these rapidly synthesized materials that were easier to manufacture um, were much harder to integrate into devices. And so once where we could use a lithography-based approach, we could integrate nanostructures into devices more effectively, um, but we, th they took a lot longer to make. They weren't as easy to manufacture. And so what I saw was that we actually needed a way to bring those together, that the next generation energy devices were going to require manufacturing and integration solutions to get these new energy materials into devices. And so I knew that very broadly, that's where I wanted to work. <laughs> um, that's what I wanted to be doing. And um, I decided to start that in the realm of um, waste heat recovery applications. So if you 
are familiar with energy at all, um, the majority of the energy resources that we use actually don't get converted into energy services like our lights and moving us in vehicles. The majority of it actually gets converted into heat that we don't use. And so in the big picture, if we're trying to actually improve our energy efficiency, how we use our resources, even from sunlight, um, not just from fossil fuels, we do have to think about how we're going to deal with waste heat. Um, and so I think about how particularly in mid to high temperature applications um, where we produce waste heat, how we could recover that waste heat. So automotive exhaust, industrial furnaces, power plants, home combustion appliances, um, there's lots of waste heat there. And I'm wondering if we could convert that waste heat into electricity because that's our most valuable resource. That's the, the service that we're actually mostly trying to go after is producing electricity. And so what I do and what I had worked on um, during my time at Stanford was working on thermoelectric power generation. So thermoelectric devices in power generation mode directly convert heat into electricity in the solid state. Um, now this is really cool because most of the systems that we use convert heat into electricity using moving parts. Um, but thermoelectrics do it in the solid state with semiconductors, um, typically an N and a P type um, combined in a, in a couple. And um, that heat is converted into electricity because of a temperature gradient across the thermoelectric material. And so what we need in these materials are uh, materials that have really good charge transport. However, at the same time, we have to minimize the thermal energy carrier transport. So this has fundamentally been a materials problem. Okay? And material scientists have said, how do we manipulate these material properties? Um, and then I came to it, you know, with an engineer with the hammers and the screwdrivers, um, and I came to these material physicists and I said, hmm, um, that's great, but what we're seeing at a device level is that all the materials improvements you're making are not actually doing anything to improve the device. And a large part of that is because of how we make these devices. Um, so these material physicists are doing this just elegant physics and materials design and then that beautiful material goes through like a 80 year old manufacturing process, um, which it still strikes me to this day as being so antiquated. Um, but the general process is that these materials, um, you form, you alloy the material, um, you then press it into a large ingot, um, you take that and you dice it with a saw, um, you metalize it so that you can make electrical connections, and then you take these little diced parts and you braise and solder them onto electrical shunts and you sandwich it between two ceramic plates. Um, and I thought this was just, was just remarkable um, because this whole geometry, the way these devices are designed, is completely limited by the manufacturing process. There is nothing in this design that occurs because we're trying to optimize power output, we're trying to optimize thermal management in the device, None of that goes into how we make these devices. And I, I'm kind of shocked by that, I still am, which is why I'm working on this. Um, moreover, um, one of the cost drivers for these devices and um, the limitations to getting them into applications is that these materials are quite expensive. Many of them use rare earth elements. In this manufacturing process, when you make it this way, you throw away over 50% of that really expensive thermoelectric material. Um, which, again, is shocking. And then we, we do this very mechanical component of taking legs and attaching them with metal onto electrical shunts. Um, so this interface is an electrical and thermal interface that completely degrades our device performance and doesn't enable us to in effectively integrate our materials into the devices. Um, and <laughs> Most of the assembly for these, these modules um, that look like this, all the commercial ones look like this, is done by hand. So there are these large factories of people sitting in front of magnifying glasses that are picking these up and placing them down. That's how they're made. So as you can see, I hope, there's a lot of room for innovation um, in this link between materials manufacturers and devices. And that's the vision that I have, is that I didn't know how we were going to achieve it, but if we could do a bottom-up materials to device approach, we could actually really change how we make de energy devices from so semiconductor materials, solid state energy conversion devices. 
So on the materials level, we could engineer the material composition. We could control the structure from the nano to the meso scale. From a manufacturing perspective, we could enable new tunable geometries beyond ones that were limited by subtractive manufacturing techniques. Um, we could eliminate assembly steps. And from a system integration point, the key limiter to applications, we could actually build thermoelectric materials and devices into the systems where they were supposed to go, and we could engineer those interfaces that are the key points of degradation in um, thermal electrical transport in the devices. So that was my vision. I didn't know how we were going to get there. We spent a, a fair amount of time, me and a postdoc, looking through different manufacturing approaches and seeing what could get us there. And we landed after you know, a lot of analysis that we wrote about um, on an additive manufacturing approach um, called selective laser melting. If you're in additive manufacturing, people like to call it laser powder bed fusion. Um, and this is a technique that's actually been used for a couple of decades now where um, you lay down a very thin, about 100, 100 micron thick layer of powder material. You use a laser that you scan across that layer. Um, you very rapidly melt and re-solidify that material. Um, and then you slowly build up a part. And then at the very end, you all of the powder that's unmelted, you recycle it. So you pull all of that away, and then you can use it to build your next part. And in the end, um, you get a part where you have been able to 3D print um, whatever geometry you want. Um, so this technique has been used to create strong, lightweight, customized parts with very small and complex features. This is why we like this technique. Um, this is we get this customization, and I get this ability to do hierarchical scaling. Oops, my time is up. Wow, I talk a lot. Um, can I go through really, really quickly? OK. Um, you don't need to see the results of where we've gotten. <laughs> but my idea is that um, we could actually create sheets of material that form the bodies of devices um, where you have a lot of heat generation. And so what I found is that people had not actually, I had planned to just do this um, on my materials, but no one had actually tried selective laser melting on semiconductor materials, and that's where most of my research has been. So I have become a powder metallurgist, and I figured out how do you actually do the powder metallurgy for semiconductor materials in these processes? Um, because no commercial system is available to process semiconductor materials in this way. Um, I've had to build my own laser system, which took me a while to figure out how to do, but I've done it. Um, so I have a custom system that operates just like the commercial systems, but I can put whatever, whatever material I want in it. Um, and I've done a lot of modeling to understand how this process would translate to our materials. Not a lot of modeling, um, but a fair amount of modeling to understand it. Um, and then we've investigated the microstructure and phase that forms um, when you do rapid melting in solidification on semiconductor materials using um, laser-induced heating. And um, we've discovered really unique transport properties that you can't actually get any other way um, that we've seen in making um, thermoelectric <clears throat> devices, that this technique actually allows us to control um, the structuring of the material such that we can control thermal and electrical transport, which is really cool. Um, and we've been the first people to actually demonstrate that we can build parts. And I'm not sure if the video works, but oh, hopefully it does. Um, we've used a two-laser system to do in situ, maybe it doesn't, um, okay, maybe it doesn't, um, in situ characterization of the process. Um, and, and so that's been really interesting to be able to see it at the same time. So I've done all of this with my group. Um, I have been able to use this work um, to help me train students in um, two fellows programs that I've created myself in nanotechnology and energy. And so we are each year training students in, in the skills that I think are the high tech skills of the future. Um, and we have got some great collaborators and some people particularly early on who threw some money at us to try it out and see what happened. And I'm very appreciative of that. So sorry I went over time. Maybe a one question. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so I, I think today I'm really excited to tell you the story of how I came to make medical devices at the nanoscale at Carnegie Mellon University. And so um, at the bottom of the screen, I just wanted to highlight my experience. 
So I spent years designing every part of the salad spinner. Like, I'm responsible for the new salad spinner. I worked in industry in a product design, consumer products, and medical devices before returning to graduate school. At graduate school, I got really interested in microfabrication for understanding mechanobiology. Um, and I spent so long uh, at a microscope that I actually fell in love with my favorite machine, and, and that is the muscle sarcomere. So, uh, and so this has led to um, sort of the interesting uh, direction of my research today. And so I want to first start by saying that uh, these are the people responsible for all the work that I'm going to show. And this is my group, the Microsystems and Mechanobiology Lab at uh, Carnegie Mellon. If you want to know more, you can search for Bex at CMU, and this will come up, or MMBL, the mumblers, as I call them. <laughs> okay, and then I usually just highlight a little bit about me. Um, and so I'm very interdisciplinary. I'm in mechanical engineering, but I have a courtesy in biomedical as well as electrical and computer engineering. So we really are making like nano, bio, mechano, electro sensors and devices. Um, I think in my, in my experience, uh, working in industry was one of the most important things that I did. But then also being in an environment like Stanford, um, I had the opportunity to get extremely excited about biology. And that happened late. I didn't think biology was interesting until late in my PhD. Right? And then I did a PhD minor <coughs> once I realized what I've been missing. And then I was able, at a place like Stanford, to transition to a biochemistry group and really go deep, uh, learning how to work with proteins and, and learn about mechanics at the nanoscale. So I'm grateful for that. Okay. So one of the main focuses of my research is really cardiovascular biomechanics. And as mechanical engineers, it makes tons of sense to study the heart. It is a high performance pump. You know, the best pumps that we can come up with um, can undergo about a billion cycles before you have to take them apart and rebuild them and the heart fixes itself on the fly. It has limited capacity to regenerate and makes a lot of scars, but also it doesn't stop when it gets injured and pumps about the same number of times. And then at the nanoscale, you also have, you have structure across the scales, and here we have individual molecular motors, so these are myosin heads, grabbing onto these actin filaments, and as they contract, they pull and cause the muscle uh, to contract. Anyway, so. Um, these are all just in themselves very mechanical <coughs> systems, and they really motivate uh, why I think it's important for mechanical engineers to be involved in this research. Um, in addition, just broadly, like one in three deaths in the United States or developed countries are due to cardiovascular disease. Um, if, you th if you catch a cardiovascular disease, usually it's pretty, pretty well advanced, right? And so my group is really interested in figuring out how to make tools to help us detect disease earlier and treat it, right? So the ultimate goals for me are really biomechanical in nature. I'm trying to make tools to help uh, sort of medicine in the future. All right, now here was that structure that I was alluding to. And so you can actually be fascinated by the heart at, at many different scales. I'm excited about the, you know, tens to hundreds of micron scale where you actually literally have this like living lattice that contracts every second that you're alive. All right, and so uh, how, do I, how do I preface this? So when I went to the biochemistry department to learn about molecular motors, I didn't know anything about DNA origami at all, right? And so I was uh, fortunate to participate in a collaboration where we were actually building a synthetic thick filament. And so um, I, I have little notes here. So if you were taking notes, this is all I want you to learn from this slide. DNA origami is really useful for helping us build biomimetic structures. And so what's really cool in this work, it basically proved to me that one, we could do biological experiments with this synthetic material. We could decorate our material um, with nanometer scale precision to make structures that never existed in nature and actually study how these systems are regulated, right? Um, so this was, my, this was my, my entree into this. But like, what is DNA origami? Okay, so. <laughs> So essentially, um, everything you see on the screen is on the order of 100 nanometers in section. So if you think about your hair, that's one one thousandth of the width of a hair. So you could line up a thousand of those little smiley faces across a single hair. So these are really small. And um, there's a couple of really key takeaways. So DNA origami is made of DNA. Um, if you were a chemist, you were not excited by DNA. Right? Or, I mean, there are DNA chemists, but generally it's pretty well understood. And so I want to convince you that it's boring. Right? This is not RNA. This is, I mean, there are some, there are some DNA science, but it's not super exciting. It's not like, you know, the cutting edge. 
it might just be a building material. Okay. Um, and you can, it's a building material that will build itself. We can program structures to form through an annealing process. So that's really cool. Okay. Other things that are really fabulous are, um, if you think about an enzyme, do you, you'll think about sharp corners. They arise from the manufacturing procedures we have at the macro scale and how we work with materials, right? So as you get smaller and smaller, structures tend to look different. But because of the math um, in building nanostructures out of DNA, you can make rectilinear structures. You can make things that are direct analogies from the macro scale all the way on down. And as someone that likes to design mechanisms, this produces some really interesting opportunities right, for, for building at the nanoscale. I would be happy to talk about the math of this for the entire rest of the afternoon and all through lunch offline, but it's really beautiful. You can make stresses, uh, structures that aren't pre-stressed. So in solution, they don't twist. And as effectively, if you imagine doing an experiment in silico, we can now make these impossible experiments happen in real life in the lab. Okay. And so um, as someone that thinks about stress and strain, you can also program them to be remotely triggerable um, to experience, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say remote sugar. First, I should say we can actually program them to have to be pre-stressed. So we can make a structure like a tube, and then in solution, as it forms, it'll twist. And if we balance out the twist, we can actually create purely pure bending in structures. Um, and this, this opens the door for these responsive structures, uh, like we have in the top right, where when a single molecule strand, like a single like trigger strand or molecule of interest binds, you can get a global transformation in the shape of a structure, right? So this responsive structures at the nanoscale, there's huge opportunities for this and for force measurement and detection. Okay, so that's my intro to DNA origami. Recently, my lab put out a review paper where we really synthesized what was going on, <laughs> what was going on in the field. And I think that the interesting takeaway um, that we brought from this is that as a material for nanobiosensing, DNA is unique, right? So we can pick what we sense that, you know, anything in the column on the left. And then independently, we can determine how we're going to transduce that signal into something that a detector that we like can sense. And so we're really interested in my lab in these mechanical ones, so the second category. Um, and you can imagine saying, okay, I want a structure that reports the strain or the deformation fluorescently, right? Maybe I want a structure and I want the wall shear stress to be reported as a change in MRI contrast. Like this is sort of a world where we've got some really great opportunities for sensing. And so today in like in my very, very few minutes, I, I want to introduce you to a few projects in my lab. And they're going to be nanotiles, nanosprings, microswimmers, and then I'll hint at some other applications that we're interested in. But the first project was make a breadboard, right? And decorate it as densely as possible. Can we decorate a breadboard every seven, six, three nanometers and literally make it like a cactus, you know? And so then the idea is um, we work with our R&D team, which is basically the chemistry department at CMU, to develop new technologies to enable dense decoration. But then for applications, um, we are thinking about things like protective cladding that removes itself on demand, programmed surfaces, um, that will enable us to amplify signal for biosensing. And even basic things, like we can orient molecules and program how close they are together. And so the opportunities uh, in the short term for uh, sensing application diagnostics uh, are really exciting. Uh, and all that we're really doing is focusing on the manufacturing of a small breadboard tile construct. So that's one thing. Um, here are some tiles. So this is... Uh, AFM, we also do TEM with these, and we're just trying to like decorate them really densely. Here's another project that uh, we're funded by the Air Force to study uh, tiny little nano springs. And so it's really fun to follow the Cool Lab because the purpose of this work is really to make a sensor with a tunable length that could ultimately uh, help us measure strain and stiffness in soft materials and map that in three dimensions. Right? And so this would be really interesting if you wanted to understand fibrosis in a tissue, right? Or if you were imaging the brain and you wanted to see variations in stiffness across, across a tissue. So we play these games where we basically make these little springs and then on demand we twist and untwist them. And then the idea is that as they twist, if they're stuck to something, they'll twist less than if they were free in solution. And so if we can directly measure their conformational change, we could actually read out stiffness as a function of length. Oh, I'm pretty close to the end. Okay, good. 
So, and then the third thing, which I just think is funny, because when I came to CMU, I would explain what I do, and people would tell me, oh, you do nanorobots. And I'd be like, no, 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 that's, that's, that's silliness. No, I don't do that. And about a year into working at CMU, I started thinking, man, you know, I think the best way to describe this would be nanorobots. <laughs> um, and so, lo and behold, you know, it's actually really useful if you have a nanoscale adapter, right, and it's tunable, and it's responsive to your triggers, and it can help um, assemble other structures, well then that's a really, really great tool for hybrid microscale assembly because you can do both top down and bottom up. And so we're actually trying to make uh, the smallest magnetically actuated uh, articulated micro swimmers uh, with a collaborator in robotics who focuses on geometric control. So the idea is we're trying to use the origami to connect magnetic micro swimmers uh, that can swim through the capillaries. Anyway. Um, and so this actually turns out to be a really rich area uh, for investigation and a really good application for manufacturing. And so just to show you the scale, this is a capillary that's about six to eight microns in diameter. We're hoping our little swimmers can swim through there. And if you see my smiley face. Okay, so um, to summarize uh, what I want you to learn from today. So first of all, I usually ask people two main questions. And so one thing I want, I want to ask you, despite knowing how exciting DNA nanotechnology is, Double-stranded DNA is A, boring, B, exciting. Raise your hand if you think it's boring. I won't be offended. I hope you say it's boring. Okay, yeah. Oh yeah, it's already there, sorry. No, it's, sorry, it's boring, it's boring. Think of it as a simple engineering material. Okay, and so then the next one is, in terms of stiffness, Young's modulus, double-stranded DNA is most similar to which type of material? I don't know if I went over this in detail, but is it a gooey gel? No, right. So it's either a hard plastic or glass or metal, right? But I want you to take away from this that it's more like a hard plastic, right? So it's much softer than these like kilopascal tissues that it's around. So you could think of it as a scaffolding material. So anyway, so answer B. Um, and I just want to quickly say thank you all for listening. I want to thank um, our funders and then um, and all, all the students in my lab at CMU and the DARE Fellowship Program. And then I just want to leave uh, open up for questions while putting some pictures from the Women in Mechi group at CMU up on the board. So please ask me about this too. Well, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Um, I'm, I'm currently doing a postdoc at University of Michigan and uh, through the through uh, Energy and Efficiency Postdoc Research Award. Um, and today I kind of want to take an opportunity to kind of think about since we're here to celebrate there at 10, kind of ideate more in terms of like what's kind of like the next 10 years uh, looking like and how we can work together to, to make that happen. So essentially it's like kind of harnessing the essence of minds and atoms, meaning adding, like, like you said, we kind of talked about it, it's like, you know, the ability to form connections, the ability to form bonds and that leading to higher order structure, complex structure kind of opens up so many opportunities. And that's the case at the material world with atoms, but also in the human, more abstract world with, with minds. And, and I think we've seen that um, over and over again these past couple of days, which has been a great to experience. Um, so like big picture, some of the pressing problems we have coming up uh, in the next 10 years that we need to address. Uh, are very intricate, intermixed, interconnected. Um, so it does require a very holistic approach to, to these type of problems and thinking about solution strategies that are comprehensive. Um, and one way to do that, one way to embrace that complexity is to harness um, the underlying phenomena that leads to this higher order structure. Um, in the case of the material world, atoms, coordination environments, bonding, and then you get properties from that. But in terms of like actually communities and cultures, thinking about how minds come together and work together. Because at the end of the day, like we're gonna get some hierarchical complex <coughs> structure, whether we want, the, whether it's the one that we want or are aiming for, or the one that we don't want. But as soon as you have interactions happen, the underlying phenomena will give rise to structure. Um, and that's something that, uh, at least through, through the professional experience I've had in academic, is something that comes more a little bit uh, understanding of. Uh, as the, at the PhD level, um, working with Fritz Prince, thinking about atomic layer deposition, 
both its value but also its cost. Its value in the sense you do have that tunability, that control of atomic structure, but the cost in the sense that it's very difficult to understand what you're making. Yeah, it's difficult to characterize what you're making. It's actually a very slow process. So when we're thinking about scalability, you know, ALD by itself doesn't make sense in the big picture. Um, then I went to industry where they're actually pushing the edge of like <coughs> atomic scale uh, materials engineering uh, and thinking about how, how do they approach those problems. Because they actually have scaled uh, these techniques and, have, and are making technology with it. And some of the concepts there you see is that concept of design and thinking about the system as a whole. Uh, and, that inner, and that connection between like the process chemistry and the hardware physics. And here is an example of uh, a heater pedestal where you see different uh, components of it. And these are complex structures and this is just one part of the whole system. Uh, and any design changes that you need to make down the road, the more this uh, hardware has been optimized and the more it has been fitted to a particular process, the more costly it is to make a change. And something they drive to the engineers is to really think about this curve, about concept design and manufacturing, to really try to think ahead as much as you can to avoid manufacturing costs down the road. So and for the postdoc, I'm essentially trying to combine the both. Uh, similarly, thinking about, okay, how do you do create a system that you do have atomic level control, but you can kind of scale it up and then address it and understand material properties using device uh, samples like uh, transistors, CMOS inverters, or tandem solar cells, so energy efficiency. So both like energy efficiency in terms of manufacturing, but also energy efficiency <coughs> in terms of device performance and renewable energy. Um, but the more you look into it, the more you realize like technology by itself just won't make it. It, it won't cut it. Even if we have the best technology now, we're just not going to get to where we need to get if we, if we think technology will, will be the all cure-all. Um, so it is a change in mindset that we need to take. It is a change of how we see the world. It is a change of how we work with one another. Uh, it is a change of how we see ourselves um, in the bigger picture. And, and it's not to be trying to be accusatory or anything. Like, like being wasteful and negligent to some extent is non-intentional. That's, that's why we, it, it is easy to be wasteful and because there is no intention. It takes a lot of intention to be resourceful and caring. Um, it, it does take a mindful presence, awareness, and uh, pretty much day-to-day -day thinking about it um, um, and trying and working on that. Um, so, but that's the nice thing about DARE. Like, I think DARE has taught us to do that. Like, DARE has taught us about like, those little microaggressions, thinking about inclusion, thinking about all these subtle interactions between people and think about how that actually translates into building culture, community, and being able to build uh, teamwork. So to address some of the most pressing challenges, we actually, we actually are we're living uh, a very good prototype. Like we're in the design phase of something that actually can be scaled and can actually, I, 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 it, it does seem to, 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 um, to be able to be a promising route to address some of those challenges. And one way to do that is to, to to just do again back to similar uh, analogy between electron orbitals and then you know, we consider empathy orbitals. So for atoms, they're electron orbitals. For us, we have empathy orbitals. Um, that's our ability to connect with other people, to understand ourselves and to understand one another. That gives us the ability to um, form these bonds. So like a simple, simple model, and this is something I'd like to get your feedback on, is you know, we talk about complexity as you have more and more interactions. But there's also this notion of activation. Um, and in terms of like materials, we think about energy budget. Uh, we think about like annealing, for, for example, to give that higher order structure to get the properties you want. But for us, activation is, is actually like mental training, like thinking about that mindfulness, that awareness, and, and to some extent that, that empathy. That is what gives us the ability to be activated. And when we're activated, when we come together, that's when, the, the, that's when the hierarchy of structure just takes off. We really don't have much control over that. We have control over this, but not much over that. So even though we want to aim for that, like our focus and our, and our meaningful control is at, the, at, the, at that level. And then when we work together, then that's when that like, beautiful complexity arises. Um, 
so there is responsibility in terms of um, thinking about uh, what is it that we're focusing on, what is it that we put attention to, uh, how is it that we actually try to understand ourselves, others, and then thinking about what is that collective influence we want to aim for. Um, so kind of like to, uh, to kind of put it in perspective, or like to kind of think about it, and this is good because these are questions we actually thought about you know, these couple, the past couple of days. It's like moving forward, well, what, what do we think about? Um, you know, I think it's easy to, to, to think about. Um, I think when we say diversity, sometimes when we're in a f room with a lot of people with high ed higher education, um, talking about these issues are not as complicated as it can be with when you're actually dealing with much more diversity in terms of socioeconomic status and um, education levels and definitely polar, polarized uh, um, political ideas. So I think our challenge is <clears throat> the more someone looks different, the more we have to commit to that understanding, the more we have to seek that understanding. That's actually um, a very difficult thing to do. Um, but why is it difficult? Because there's, there's something that to some extent we've missed uh, in terms of like human development in terms of like, what is sustainable? Like if we want sustainable society, uh, we have to have sustainability kind of within us. Um, so are we prioritizing the key lessons in education top down, not just university level, but like right from the beginning? Are we focusing on the fundamental skills and constantly reinforcing these skills to be able to, to, to deal with more complicated um, problems? Uh, and to, one way to understand what are those skills that we need to address, we need to think about, well, con constantly reflecting on these more like existential questions, but at, it, at the same time it's like more like just mindfulness awareness questions, like, you know, who are we, where are we from, and where, where are we going? Um, because sometimes we forget <coughs> that, um, that at, the, at some level being a human takes a lot of work, because we've been given, as we have seen with the, all the beautiful biomaterials that we have within us, um, a lot of complexity, a lot of ability to think, to be creative. That, that is a lot of privilege. But with that privilege comes a, a lot of responsibility. Um, and being able to be clear on what that responsibility entails and how we actually deliver on that responsibility. Um, so, like, uh, Meadows um, in a the other part, the people um, research when a few years after we got a first glimpse of how Earth looked from the moon, it did trigger uh, like a movement of thinking about like how is the environment coming, like what are the things we're doing to the environment. Um, and one thing after doing some system analysis uh, on how different populations are growing, how we're using resources, the, the ecological footprint uh, that we have, the carrying capacity of Earth, after doing that, um, this is what they, what they kind of uh, attest to. Say. We have affirmed finally that any deliberate attempt to reach a rational and enduring state of equilibrium, which we can kind of approach that to sustainability, um, by planned measures rather than by chance or catastrophe, must be ultimately founded on the basic change of values and goals at individual, national, and world levels. So that, that is, to some extent, back in the 70s, um, we, we highly, highly reached that type of uh, level of awareness. And I think now it's, uh, and it's never too late to always be kind of thinking about what does that mean and how does that look like. And when you think about systems at, at a global level, these are very important driving uh, factors, thinking about what are you valuing and what are your goals and what are you measuring and what's that feedback, what is that feedback. Um, in terms of like how, you, how does the system know how to re-equilibrate, how does it know to correct. Um, so yeah, so these are more thinking ahead like, you know, what is it that, where are we at, where we want to go, um, and yeah, and, and really would like your, your input in terms of like, uh, you know, what do you think about these uh, type of issues, where do you think we should focus on, uh, and what, what is it that we could work on together. So with that, I'd like to thank um, uh, the Prince Group, where I did the PhD and started there as an undergrad researcher. Uh, and then I went, and then their cohort, um, 
uh, who I think kind of starting reflecting back on that experience is just knowing and trying to build that understanding with one another um, was fairly helpful to, to get an idea of what type of work we need to do. Uh, and then going to apply materials, getting industry experience there, but also again seeing some of the challenges they deal with when having to, to, to innovate at a fast pace. And then right now I'm currently working with Neil Descupta, a friend who I worked with in the Prince Group, and now is where we're trying to kind of do the um, scaling and reaching these type of like more energy efficiency ma manufacturing processes and renewable energy technology. And uh, uh, key collaborators throughout the, the process.